Aaron, and welcome to the, the JPP, uh, the Jewish Humanity Podcast. And uh, the opening question that I, I often ask uh, all of my guests is to please share with us, uh, in your own words, uh, who our known craft is. So I think it's an interesting time in our lives without question. Um, I, I think I assume that probably the answers might change from time to time. But if I think about it today, um, first and foremost, an Israeli, a proud Israeli, I would say, um, a father to four amazing kids, a husband to Karen, um, a long distance friend and partner, and I would say connector of people. Um, one of the things I discovered about myself throughout my 51 years is that I'm a, a sentimental pragmatist, which might sound um, a contradiction, but it's really not. Um, I'm told that I'm a good listener, which I think is a skill that I wish more people had. Um, I'm certainly a diehard uh, Philadelphia Eagles fan. Really? Uh, I'm a yes, big Dallas Cowboy fan. And so it's so funny because I'm also 51. I'm also a, a, a sentimental pragmatist I could uh, relate to, but Eagles, Cowboys, that may not uh, they yeah. have touched him. <laughs> we can cut the conversation <laughs> for it right now. That's funny. Uh, How did you become an Eagles fan? Uh, so I grew up in the 80s in Haifa, Israel, and then at some point we moved to Philadelphia for a few years. Uh, so I did my middle school in, in Philly, um, and I'm, I'm I, you know, stuck with the Eagles and Sixers for life, I guess. Um, so there are worse, have... worse teams to be stuck with, that's the truth. Um, I think down. you need to look very hard to find worse teams, but yeah. <laughs> interesting. So, yeah. so interesting. So I, I like what you're saying in terms of being a good listener. Uh, you want to elaborate a little bit on the sentimental pragmatist and also on the connector. That's very, I think, important. Yeah. So my profession is a tech executive for the past 20 some years. Uh, before that, I spent seven years um, in the Israeli Navy here. Um, oh. And I'm very keen on execution and specifically that, that you know, combination of business and execution. And in many cases, that seems like a very, you know, pragmatic practical approach uh, with, I, I would say, no emotions, but the sentimental pragmatist part of it is um, that as it relates to people, and it goes back to the connector, and, and you know, one of the companies I worked uh, for in the early 2000s, I think it was the only value we had as a corporate culture, uh, which later I really found out how important that is uh, when I was with Microsoft, but the only value we had was people first. And I admit that when I was younger, you know, it sounded like a super cliche, uh, but really the more I've been in different companies, the more people I've met, the more people I've worked with, I'm not saying that people can create anything or make anything happen, uh, but I think just about almost. Uh, so I think there's a lot of, you know, sentiments that go into what we do, how we do, who we do it with. Um, and I think not, everybody show emotions the same way um, and somebody along the way you know coined that term or brought up that term for me that i'm a sentimental pragmatist and, and i really relate to that so it's really interesting i mean I've, I've i've noticed and i think we've even had some guests uh, of this uh one of our guests was uh gary vaynerchuk gary vaynerchuk has a chief heart officer at his uh at his mm -hmm. company which is interesting uh, I'm blanking on her name right now, but she's one. She's been one of our podcast guests, I think, last year. And it's it's interesting. You do see some larger corporations kind of investing much more in HR and and kind of you know not just human resources in the sense of like you know where how do you get your paycheck type of thing, but really <laughs> investing in people's well being and in and, and enjoying where they are and building you know a greater sense of of, of team and buy in. So. These are these are great values uh, for sure, and well, I'm sure we'll get into it in terms of Israeli society today, how it's uh, yeah, well, critical sure. uh, in the war effort. You, you were in Shayet at uh, 13, or that's a different. Uh, no, I was in the IT actually in the Navy. Um, so we did a lot of um, information systems, especially for managing and controlling operations live as as they went along. Um, extremely interesting, extremely rewarding in terms of the value that I felt we were bringing and the impact we were making. Uh, so I was an officer. Um, I worked with all the different Navy units. 
um, met a lot of amazing people, um, kind of in a weird way. That's how I met my wife as well. Um, I think, you know, we can get to that later as well. But one of the best advice that I've ever got was definitely that that's definitely the one. Um, so yeah, I was there for seven years and then decided I wanted to go try, you know, the private sector. Um, and that's how I started my career. Is there still like reserves for that, for like what you, like for what you do or not really? In, initially there was in the first years after I did my service, but again, now I'm 51. Um, there's no reserves for that. Got it. Okay, so tell me a little bit about uh, your family, kind of growing up. Where, where exactly? It sounds like you were, you've been, you were in the states. You were obviously in Israel. Tell us a little bit yep. just about your 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 family, your upbringing, and some of the values that were communicated there. So yeah, as, so as I mentioned, um, I was brought up for the most part in Haifa here in Israel, but also with a few years stay in Philadelphia when I was in, when I was in middle school in the eighties. And I think about a few things come to mind when, you know, we talk about influence or, or values, what mainly influenced me. Um, I think first and foremost, um, definitely has to be my parents. Uh, so I think watching them as I was growing up really influenced how I think about marriage and, you know, forget marriage, just couplehood to this very day. Um, and it also helped to shape my beliefs and values uh, about knowing that somebody is always there, you know, supporting you and, and has your back and putting, you know, us with three brothers, uh, putting us as the kids first, which, by the way, now that I'm a parent, we have four kids, doesn't mean, at least for me, um, it does not mean doing everything for your kids. It doesn't mean giving them everything. Um, and I really believe today that it's not, actually my job to make my kids happy. That's their job. My job is to give them tools so they can make themselves happy. And again, everybody has different parenting styles and I think that diversity is beautiful, uh, but we definitely see a lot of you know parents today who think they need to give their kids everything. Um, and again, the way I grew up, I really had everything I needed, um, but mainly I knew that my parents are always there for me, uh, which was the most important thing. And I think the other thing that my parents taught me, and, and again, this was not, you know, in so many words, just watching them work. And my dad is 81 years old. He still works today. Um, is really the value of hard work. Uh, and that, that when you have a job, it needs to be done and done right, uh, in a sense, you know, without complaining. Um, and I really used to think that that's obvious and trivial and commonplace. But as I grew up, um, I learned that it's not, really something that you see every day for, for everybody. And I will have to say that apart from my parents, I think that our years that we spent in the US, and again, it was only two years, so it wasn't a you know, huge duration of time, uh, but it really taught me a great deal, mainly about how people are different and cultures are different. And you know, moving from Israel in the 80s to Philadelphia, I was in school with people from all over, obviously in the US, but from Korea and Brazil and Argentina and people from different cultures and, and backgrounds. Um, and I think that, you know, even relatively short amount of time was really the greatest gift that I could have asked for without probably knowing it even, because it really opened up my mind to look at things differently and to be open. And I think even to this very day, and I'm not a you know qualified psychologist, but I think even today it created this passion I have and hunger or you know, working with or just getting to know people from different cultures. One of the things I'm really happy I had the chance throughout my career and I'm proud of is the fact that I have so many business partners, but also friends in you know China, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, obviously the US, Germany, UK. Um, and I think that that's a beautiful thing that um, I don't know how I could have achieved without having the career that I had, but also without that experience as a kid growing up um, in the U.S. Fascinating. Was your are your parents uh, diplomats? Like, what brought you to the states? Like, uh, what, no, what... My, my dad works in tech. Uh, he was a CFO of a firm. He was working with that firm here in Israel. Then um, we moved to Philadelphia because he became CFO of the entire global corporate, um, and the headquarter was in Philly. So. We moved there. 
Um, and then, you know, we moved back, he continued the same job, but I think that experience of really growing up, even for a few years in a different place, speaking a different language, but really more important, having friends from all over uh, was just eye-opening. And I, I don't, you know, remember this, but now as an, as an adult, I, I definitely know that that's what created that, you know, passion and hunger to get to know different people and experience different cultures. Um, and I, I think that's something that I hope all, all people would have more of. Very interesting. I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit because I wouldn't necessarily jump right into October 7th and, and, and events so quickly. Yeah. But I'm curious in the sense that you mentioned that you have global relationships and friendships rooted in your childhood and high school years and it's helped you throughout your career and your outlook. I'm curious what kind of feedback you receive from a lot of these friends in different different parts of the world uh, post October seventh after such events unfolded. So look, all the feedback, comments, um, you know, WhatsApp messages, text messages, WeChat from China um, that I have received have been extremely supportive. Um, you know, empathetic, sympathetic. Um, you know, more than I could imagine from all of my friends from, from Seattle, from other places in the US, from China, from Korea, from Taiwan, um, has really been heartwarming to see. Um, but I think, you know, I, I look at my kids, my kids grew up almost seven years in, in Seattle. Um, and, you know, some of their friends that they went to high school with, um, you know, they see them posting on Instagram, um, you know, free Palestine or, or whatever else, um, Pro Hamas narratives that they hear, um, which to say that's disappointing, I think, is a you know gross understatement, um, and, and that has been extremely disappointing, frustrating, and I would say even shocking to me, is witnessing the you know the aftermath of what happened after October seventh in the world, and especially in the U.S. and in the U.N. for that matter as well. Um, I lived in the U.S. twice in my lifetime. I have never ever felt or experienced any act or a sense of anti-Semitism. I always felt safe, you know, to be a Jew and to let people know that I'm Jewish. Uh, so for this to so fundamentally change now really made me question if Jewish people can ever really feel safe outside of Israel uh, and what does that mean. Um, so and 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 I think for me, you know, that the the notion that some people, I admit myself included here in Israel, had before October 7th that, yes, we know Hamas is evil, but honestly, we thought that at some point they you know, also won the state and there'll be some version of peace. So that obviously went away. But I think the disappointment in seeing Europe and the U.S. and all these protests of people who, for the most part, it, it seems like are doing it out of ignorance and not even understanding what they're saying and what river they're talking about and what sea they're talking about. Um, it, it's just, um, again, I, I don't have a stronger word than disappointing or frustrating, but um, definitely. Yeah. It's very, very, very disheartening. You know, we're, we're having this conversation a few days after uh, events in Los Angeles uh, in Pico Robertson. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, you know, when I first, like on Twitter, when I first noticed on X, when I noticed like, what was going down and I saw the location and like, these are places that I visited, you know, so many times and I have friends that are, that are communal leaders in that community. I mean, it's just, it's astounding to see uh, these types of things, you know, you kind of, whatever, you know, we always tell ourselves, we try to convince ourselves that it's, yeah, it's, it's whatever, it's fringe, it's here, it's not really whatever, you know, so on and so forth. But unfortunately the evidence keeps uh, mounting that that is not, you know, in fact, uh, you know, and even if it's not the majority of uh, Americans, which I, I don't believe that it is, but it's still a very strong, uh, a disconcerting minority, and it's uh, it's definitely uh, you know something we have to continue to keep uh, keep our eyes on. I'm imagining your time in Seattle was with Microsoft. Those seven years you were you worked in Microsoft. So let's were, get, okay, maybe just take us a little bit through your career. Tell us a little bit just kind of how you. Growing up, what, what did you envision for yourself? Your father was a tech executive. Maybe you thought similar path ultimately, or maybe you thought something different. And how did your career begin to unfold? Um, so I don't even remember that I had any plan originally. Um, I went 
to what's called the academic reserve here in Israel. So I did my um, university or engineering school before the military service. Most kids go to the military and then they go to school. Um, I did it the opposite. So I did four years of engineering school, then went, as I mentioned, to the Navy. Uh, and after seven years, basically, I decided my career. Um, I did IT information systems in the Navy. So I kind of figured, hey, that's going to be my career. So I started my career with information. By the way, so how did how do how did you get to do it reverse? Like if most people don't do it that way, how does that? So if you have certain grades in high school, they let you go straight to university to get your engineering degree, and then instead of the mandatory three years service, uh, you have to do six. Um, so I actually did seven. I added another year. Uh, I was an officer, um, and then I started my career also in IT, selling SAP here in Israel. Um, and then, you know, a friend from the Navy called me and said, look, I'm working at this company called M Systems. We just invented this product called uh, Disk on Keys. It's called here in Israel, a USB flash drive. Looking for a head of marketing. Um, obviously, I had no experience with marketing or a consumer brand. Um, but I think that's one of the beautiful things about here in Israel. When you know somebody, um, you don't necessarily need to have the right resume uh, because they know your skills and what you're capable of. Um, and that's how I started my career early 2000s in the consumer electronic space. Um, so I did marketing and then, and then sales and then business development. And then at some point, um, SanDisk out of California acquired us and I became VP for technology and operations. After a few years, I left SanDisk to join the former CEO and founder of M Systems and his new company, Modu Mobile, also as VP for operations. Um, it was a startup company. It was a really a heck of a roller coaster run with lots of ups and downs, uh, where eventually at some point we ran out of money and we had to close up shop. Um, and then I got a call from Microsoft in Redmond uh, that they heard about me from partners I worked with in the past. Uh, and in 2011, we packed up the kids. We had three kids at the time, uh, which, as you can imagine, was you know a dilemma. It wasn't an easy decision to make. Right. Uh, we literally have you know moved halfway around the world to uh, Redmond, uh, right by Seattle, um, and I spent seven years, I think, with Microsoft. Um, eventually, made it to be a GM, general manager at the devices division, so the division that does all of Xbox. Surface computers. We acquired Nokia at some point. Um, That's really it, before, way, was was AI even conceived of back in those days, or it was way no too AI was was mainly for the movies. I think at that time it wasn't some it, it wasn't a technology that anybody really you know, used back then. Um, it seemed like ages ago, and it was only what um, six seven years ago. Um, and then at some point in twenty eighteen. Our oldest son was 16 at the time. And um, I think, you know, one of the struggles or dilemmas that Israelis tend to have, and I don't, I don't think I found with other nationalities as much, is that struggle always, do we go back to Israel or do we stay here for good? Um, and for us, We've always believed that you know you the, the things you regret in life are the things that you don't do, um, not the things that you do. Um, and we said we want to go back to Israel. We we talk to our kids about the importance of family and the importance of the connections between you know siblings and with parents. And um, our kids are growing up, you know, ten hours time zone difference, 14, 15 hour flights away from the rest of their family. Um, and when our son is going to turn 18, if he decides he wants to go to the military, there's no way we're going to stay here and have him go to the military. Um, so we let Microsoft know. And in 2018, we moved back here to Israel. And we've been here ever since. Um, after we moved back, I set up my own consulting um, company uh, called Big Four Consulting for Kids. Uh, so that was an easy name to pick. Um, and I did that for two years, mainly representing companies from Asia and the U.S. here in Israel, investing in startups and finding the right technology partnerships. Um, but um, two years into that, and I really enjoyed the diversity and getting to know different companies and different people. 
I missed mainly being part, really being part of a team and, and building a team and developing a team and having the same mission and charter with the same team. Um, and then I got a call from a headhunter that Pioneer, my current employer, is looking for a COO. Um, and here we are, three and a half years later. Fascinating. So Microsoft didn't have, I mean, Microsoft must have uh, offices in Israel, but it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, we have a big office here. Um, they, they have a big office here in Israel. Uh, then offices, for the most part, R&D, development and uh, research. Yeah. Um, not really what I do. Wasn't a fit, I hear. I'd love to hear, just I'm curious, because you've had experience in both. Sounds like on the investor side, as well as an employee side, I'm curious as to your perspectives on the differences between working for a, a startup versus working for a Microsoft. Like, I mean, Microsoft was a startup one day too, obviously. Every company was, was once a startup, but, I, but, I'd love to, but I'd love to kind of hear uh, pros and cons, kind of analysis of kind of like what you gain and what you lose when you're working. Obviously, if the company runs out of money, that's a problem. But I'm saying, but, but conceptually, like what, what are some of your insights in terms of, let's say you have somebody they're considering, you know, they could, they could work for a Microsoft or they can go to a startup. Now, obviously it depends on time in their career and a lot of different variables, but yep. what, what's some of the, what are some of the thoughts you would have about that? Um, so I think that by itself is like a two hour podcast. I'm but, sure. Um, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> in five minutes. <laughs> we can find more time. Give us the Russian um, problem. Think, Give us the. the, 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 the you know. Yeah. 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 Um, I think the biggest advantage or prerogative that a startup has is the, not just the ability, but the justification to focus only on one thing and that, and do that thing in the best way possible. I think when you're a larger corporation, or a company by design, by definition, you have to do different things. Uh, but when you're a startup and the most important asset you have is time because at some point you're gonna run out of money, um, that laser focus on one thing, but being the best in class at that one thing, um, I think is is an incredible right and, and you know advantage to have. And I think if you work at a startup, you have to be ready to do everything, especially in the early stage and the seed stage and before, you know, everybody does everything. It's not the job roles and description R and Rs. They're not in place because they don't really matter. Everybody does whatever it takes to win and at first to survive. Uh, so you have to be ready to work 16, 18, 20 hour days, whatever it takes. Definitely if you're the entrepreneur who just, you know, founded a new company. Um, and I'm not saying you don't work hard at Microsoft or big companies. We definitely worked extremely hard before launching a new Xbox or Surface. Um, but you also have this mechanism, the infrastructure behind you. Um, and I think the number one skill you need to have at a larger company is how do I leverage? How do I bring all these assets that we have here at the company to the benefit of what we're trying to make? In the same way that I mentioned at, at the startup, everybody has to be laser focused on the one thing that needs to be done. In a big company, it's really easy to get kind of lost and to have, if you ask 10 different people, what's the most important thing, you'll get you know, 11 different answers. Um, and I think the hardest thing in a big company is to make sure that the different teams, department, groups, whatever you want to call them, all run in the same direction and that the objective is clear uh, because sometimes, you know, we use the words even on slides, but the way we translate them is very subjective and people kind of take away from what you say different things. And then if you don't talk to a team or a group member for a few days or weeks, they might be off doing something that's not really what you meant. In a startup, you talk to everybody pretty much every day. So it's easier to keep everybody on track to the same place. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges in a big company is to make sure that all the horses run in the same direction. Do you yourself have preference like for one model versus the other or not really? Um, honestly, no. And, and especially being here in Israel and it's kind of the, you know, the startup kingdom, people ask if you have a preference. I really, truly enjoyed the hecticness. I, I hope that's a word yeah. of being in a startup. Um, I also enjoyed the size and the scale of being at SanDisk or, or Microsoft to larger corporations. Um, one of the talks actually that I give now in Israel to startups is how to do business with um, US enterprises and the corporates because sometimes they speak 
a different language, and I don't I don't mean in Hebrew or English. It, they just they look at things very differently. Um, sometimes startups move a lot faster, and they want you know toughness. They want a yes or no answer tomorrow. Like I need to know. And enterprises take their time sometimes to make decisions. You need to identify and map who really gets to make the decision and who just pretends that they get to make the decision. Who is really on point that making this decision will help them in the company and maybe promote them and who won't. So I think these things take time. And I think people who have been in startups mm -hmm. for a number of times don't always understand or appreciate the complexity of what it's like working for a larger enterprise. Interesting. No, I think these points are uh, hundred percent on target. How would you describe kind of your role today, COO at, at, at Payoneer? What exactly uh, do you do to, day to day today? So Payoneer is a fintech. It's a payments company. Um, it's truly, I think, the most global company I've been with or, or have seen. Our management is split half and half between here in Israel and New York. Uh, we have offices in, in over 40 countries. Um, I, just for operations, I have over a thousand people um, who were spent out between Guatemala, New York, uh, Poland, and Ireland, and Europe, obviously here in Israel, India, China, Korea, Vietnam. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, so Hong Kong. So we definitely have a very global team. Our customers are extremely global uh, from your, you know, entrepreneur in the Philippines to a freelancer in Bangladesh building websites for somebody in the UK. Um, we have to understand the nuances and intricacies of all the different licenses and, um, and compliance and regulations. Um, it's an extremely exciting and interesting and, and challenging space that's always evolving and changing. Um, and operations, again, as a global team, eventually we manage all the customer journey onboarding a customer and then, you know, how they work through our platform and what they do. And of course, the support <clears throat> systems or teams that we have for our customers. Well, cool. I'm curious in terms of you've had a, a diverse and uh, fascinating, <clears throat> successful professional career in different companies, well-known companies. Does anybody stand out in your mind, somebody you interacted with over all those years, or maybe even just somebody you looked up to, maybe if you didn't have a personal connection with them, who was kind of like somebody that really, you know, jumps out in your mind as like was really inspiring to you in the professional, in the professional landscape and the professional. Uh, I'm um, just, so like, did you ever interact with Bill Gates when you were in Microsoft? I don't know if you were. I saw that. him once. I opened the door when he left my building. I told him, good morning, Bill. And he left and he said, good morning. And he left. So no, I never really interacted with him. Um, but I think if you look at, if I think about my professional career, uh, there has been many, you know, incredible managers, leaders that that I had that um, really inspired me. But the one person that I will have to say was the most inspiring is witnessing that change at Microsoft of CEO from Steve Ballmer to Satya, um, and within less than a year. And, and keep in mind, this was a company I think at the time of 150,000 people. So this is not like, you know, 20 person startup company. Within less than a year, for him to completely have changed the corporate culture of Microsoft to the extent that it, it just felt different coming into the office in the morning, the focus that he put on our customers, first and foremost, of Microsoft as a listening company, listening to our customers and partners and what they need from us, um, you know, interesting, um, just one thing I remember, I have a friend here in Israel who was a CIO at a company here at the time, and every year he used to come to Microsoft for this CIO convention retreat. And he said that when he came for the first time to this retreat after Satya took over, it just completely felt like a different company, like a different thing. It was the same campus, you know, same building. It just felt completely different. And I think for him to put that emphasis on our customers, on leaders in the company to explain what he expects from leaders. Um, and I think, you know, just understanding what corporate culture really means and how the value and the strength of having, I would say the right corporate culture um, was, was extremely inspiring. Really interesting. Wow. 
Can you talk a little bit about mentorship in the in the corporate world? I'm just I always like I like to hear people talk about in terms of the importance of having mentors, how one cultivates uh, that type of relationship. Um, sure. Um, so this is something that I've been doing for, um, I don't know, we remember for 15, 20 years now in, in various different outfits and organizations. Um, I have done mentorship here in the Technion, uh, which is where I did my engineering degree. And then later in a Tel Aviv University where I got my MBA. Um, when I lived in the U.S., I did some mentoring for um, the U.S. military veterans transitioning out of the military into the private sector. Um, I can expand on that some more. Um, I did mentorship to students in Africa um, in an organization called Global Mentoring, um, which kind of connects them with mentors because they don't have those obviously readily available in Africa for them. Uh, I was happy that the student I mentored got his visa and moved to US and he's now in Pittsburgh. Um, and I'm now doing mentoring here in Israel for an amazing organization called Restart, uh, which helps um, wounded Israeli soldiers also transition um, into life and kind of jumpstart their lives. Um, I was lucky enough to have a number of mentors, whether it was by you know title and definition or just people, especially my managers, that um, I saw them as mentors uh, or friends that I have to this very day that when I have a dilemma, when I have you know a junction in my career, I know I can go and talk to them. And I think it's extremely, extremely important to have that person or those people that you know that by definition are in your corner, that what they have is your best interest in mind. Um, and then you can come to them. The only thing I ask from people that I mentor is for it to be kind of a two-way dialogue. So not just me yapping and talking, um, which is why I asked them to always send me the day, two days, whatever, before we meet, what they want to talk about. So I can also prepare myself and come prepared to the meeting. Um, so that's it. I love that. I love people who take mentorship seriously. And uh, I, I even, it's like a silly thing, but like, I, I actually also appreciate, you know, when you go to a mentor for advice, I, to me, it's very meaningful when the mentor actually follows up to find out like, what you ultimately decided or what happened. I find that like, it, to me, I, it, it kind of is a real, dif it's a real differentiator in terms of if, you know, somebody gives you advice and guidance and then they kind of care enough to, to follow up, to find out kind of how, I mean, oh, yeah. it, it's the responsibility of the mentee to inform the mentor. That's not really the point I'm making, but I just, I find some of these people, yeah, they give you advice, but they're not really invested in you. They don't, they care less, you know what I'm saying? So that, I think that's very, uh, very powerful. Okay. Very good. So let's, let's, uh, let's move on now to, uh, to events of October 7th. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'd love to hear uh, kind of where you were before October 7th, where you are today. You talked about that a little bit, but I'd love to maybe, maybe even just practically tell us like where were you on October 7th? How did you find out about unfolding events? Uh, maybe take us kind of a little bit just through the beginning phases of that. And then maybe uh, how, how life has changed uh, for you, for the people around you over the last few months. I'm just thinking also this organization restart, uh, you know, tragically and sadly, uh, you yeah. know, have many, many more uh, soldiers to uh, to be servicing right. now. You know, I think that's right. I think, frankly, that's very much kind of an underreported aspect of the war effort. You know, there you know, it's like uh, I, don't, I don't say this properly, but like, you know, you only get the headlines if unfortunately you're you're killed. But I mean, there's so many, uh, so many soldiers that are thousands of people who were injured. And wounded. Hard, it's hard to even put the rap ones, you know, mind around those numbers. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, so October 7th, um, we were at home. My son is in the military. Um, he's actually graduating from Officers Academy next week. Um, he was at home for a weekend leave. Um, and we wake up in the morning. My mother called me and said that you know, things are happening, that, it, that the war is starting. Um, and, and that was the beginning of our Saturday, like everybody else, I assume here, sitting in front of a TV, calling everybody we know in the military. Or let me, let me stop you. Let me stop you for one second there. This is, this is for me to understand as uh, somebody sitting here in America, like a war is starting. Is that something that the Israeli mindset is that that can always happen and like 
Like to me, it sounds like a war, like a war, like that sounds, you know, we know this terror. So a, war, a war is a big word because over the past, I don't know how many years here, 20 years since 2006, the second Lebanon war was the same. I think it was the, the last officially titled full blown out war. And then ever since we had these every year, give or take, we had something. Skirmish, skirmishes. For right. most, exactly. For the most part in Gaza. Um, so to say the word war was definitely a big, heavy word to use. Um, but you believed it. Like you believed it. Like if I think when you when an Israeli hears war, you know that we're we mean business here. This isn't just like and this was even before we really went out to war. It was still mainly just being shocked of we having Hamas terrorists in our you know cities and kibbutzes and and all over and just trying to understand what is actually happening. Um, so I think just, you know, the war itself, war wasn't even what we were worried about. It was just, what the heck is going on? Where is everybody? Mm -hmm. uh, my son, again, was at home from leave from the military, he started getting on phone calls to his unit of, you know, where he needs to go, when, who did they meet up with, where. Um, so at some point we had to drop him off um, on a bus, which, of course, you know, sitting here and saying it sounds like super easy and, and chill, but when you're a parent dropping off your kid with his uniform and, you know, his weapon and everything, and you know he's going down towards Gaza um, and, and you know, joining that effort, there's, there's nothing sane about it when, when you think about it. Um, and you see all the other parents doing the same thing. Um, and Israel is a small country, so un un unfortunately, for something like that to happen, it, you're always bound to know somebody who's impacted. Um, so I have um, a business friend, partner of mine, whose son was originally thought um, was a soldier, originally thought, thought kidnapped on October 7th. Later on, they found that Itai was actually uh, murdered. Um, That's Itai Fan? That Itai Fan? Exactly. Yeah. Ruvi is, is a great, great person. and. Um, Ita is still, you know, in Gaza. Um, we have um, our best friends. Um, her brother was in the, um, he wasn't in the reserve, but he was in the, in the security unit of one of the kibbutzes in the south. In a way that nobody really understands, the terrorists didn't go into their kibbutz. They kind of just drove on by and right back went to the next one. So they hurried after them to fight them and prevent them from entering the next kibbutz. Um, and he was killed. Um, so the next morning we got a call that, um, again, our best friend's brother was killed. Somebody we knew like like, like family, um, couldn't even hold a funeral because he lived down south and obviously they weren't doing any funerals. Um, so yeah, un unfortunately, um, one of my wife's friends that she grew up with, uh, her son, was in Gaza for a few months and then he got wounded. He's still in recovery now. Um, hopefully his leg will be better. Um, it, it, it really touches everybody. Uh, we have a few kids from Zichon where we live who were in the Nova party uh, and were murdered in, in, in that party. Um, it's a small country for better or worse. Uh, so, you know, having that event with 1400 people who were murdered on that same day and then the war for what eight nine months now afterwards, um, it impacts, it, you know, everything everything you do. It's it's impossible to really feel joy and happiness like real pure joy when you know there's soldiers in Gaza, when you know there's still 120 people held hostage in Gaza, when you know that the north that most people don't talk about as much, there's like 300,000 people who had to leave their houses they live in hotels or whatever uh for nine months now kids out of any system or school um because hezbollah is, is attacking the north um so you know something has definitely got to change yeah you know it's it, those moments of unadulterated joy are certainly few and far between over the last nine months <clears throat> one moment recently when when Noah Aragamani and, and and the three men oh, yeah, sure. that was like I think the country right the, the Jewish world just needed like a reprieve for 24 hours to like celebrate something like really you know amazing uh but you know you're absolutely right it's been uh 
been treacherous and uh you know sadly it's you know it's very hard to see kind of where this where this goes where this goes from here right it's like kind of Wait. like very much uh any any words of it, of encouragement of chizuk and you don't have to have it there aren't but i'm curious if you have anything uh any silver lining that you that you have seen or anticipate seeing so look smarter people than me have said this this is not my original quote but I, you know our secret weapon is honestly we have nowhere else to go so it's not like we give up and say you know what we'll go back to whatever we're here to stay um and I think from my 51 years of experience on this planet, life is, you know, ups and downs. It's always a cycle. This cycle is definitely a drastic and extreme down, uh, but hopefully better days will come and, you know, we'll, we'll be on the high side again. Right. But you, you, alluded, you alluded to this in the sense that the last kind of full outblown war, let's say in our lifetimes that we were aware of was about 20 years ago. Right. Yep. Yom Kippur War, like, you know, we were, we were barely, you know, we were, you know, we were, we were a year old, whatever we were, you know, a year mm -hmm. old, et cetera. So it's, it, it is shocking in the sense that like, I think we've grown comfortable with like Medinat Israel, you know, Israel, what it is like, you know, there's obviously going to be, there's going to be challenges, but like, you know, I don't know, in my mind, I guess maybe like, like that full, the war is like things of the past, right? Like, it's like, maybe it's childish to think that way. But it's something that I think it's hard to wrap. Uh, and I think I, I wonder, like psychologically, like I've heard from friends that like whose kids are in the army, like they always they always knew this day could come type of thing. And I, I wonder, like, do, do people real do people really believe this kind of thing could happen? Like this day would come, but I mean, maybe yes. I mean, I just I, you know I'm one person. Look, I you know if we're trying to be positive, which is I admit hard, but we look at the trend of you know the agreements we have with. Qatar and the Emirates, the, the notion, at least before October 7th, of something positive about to happen with Saudi Arabia. So I think there is that positive on at least some of the Arab countries of normalizing the relationship and having a more structured relationship for business, for tourism with Israel. Um, hopefully, and I'm not, you know, diplomat, I don't really know the ins and outs of what they do, but hopefully at some point, you know, those will be resumed. Um, again, we have to look for some sign of optimism. And for me, that that's where it's coming from. And hopefully at some point the world will wake up um, to really the, 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 the pure evil. I'm not trying to be dramatic, but that's what it is that, oh. that Hamas is. Um, I think we need to do more as 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 Israelis, as Jewish people, as the media, as everybody, I think we need to do more. Uh, but uh, I think that's that's kind of where, where it, it, that has to go. Right. No, for sure. As as we wind down our conversation, so this is the Jewish Philanthropy Podcast, so we always like to talk to our guests a little yep. bit about uh, about philanthropy. You've already alluded to different you know philanthropic endeavors that you're engaged in and involved in. But let's just take kind of more of a holistic view to begin with. I always like to comment, you know, no, you know, even the, you know, extraordinarily wealthiest people in the world like nobody has like infinite unlimited you know resources and even if they have a lot of money they don't necessarily always have enough time or the bandwidth so i always i always like to ask my guests to kind of share a little bit your thinking in terms of how you approach philanthropy how you approach obviously you have a pretty full-time job you have like you mentioned you have four children you have a wife you have family obligations i'm sure you have extended family as well how do you kind of go about uh, designating time for philanthropic endeavors? How do you go about assessing kind of where to invest whatever resources you may yeah. have for philanthropy and what 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 do you say other people can do versus like this is something I need to do? Um, so this is something that really, um, and maybe this is not surprising, I haven't really thought about as much before we moved to the U.S. It's really engraved in, I think, in the culture in the U.S. Um, and it's really about how do you give whether it's, again, resources, money, or your time, or whatever it is to others who need it. So when I was with Microsoft, one of the requirements from GMs was to make a difference and make an impact um, on the community, really outside just the scope of your defined role. So but the theme of diversity, as I mentioned before, I decided that, that I want to allocate my time to help US military veterans 
in their transition out of the military and into the private sector. I think for obvious reasons, this is something that really I thought I really relate to. Um, so I volunteered with two specific organizations. One is called the Honor Foundation, working mainly with ex-Navy SEALs. The other one, uh, Four Block, working uh, mainly with Marines. Uh, and I really helped them to translate their skills and experiences um, and skill sets to, you know, private sector lingo. Because if you're a recruiting manager and you spend, what, 10 seconds reading a resume and it's all in terms and language that you don't really understand, you just move on. Uh, so what I worked with them face to face, but also in talks that I gave was really how to take all these experiences and still still be proud of what you've done, but just put it in a language that somebody who doesn't have that background um, can, can understand. And now, as I said, being back in Israel, I volunteer with this really amazing people. Um, it's an org called Restart, uh, which is a nonprofit helping wounded soldiers to restart their life journey um, after physical or emotional trauma. Um, and I think that, that to me is something that's extremely gratifying uh, to work with these people, just to help them navigate through the different dilemmas in life. When, you know, you know, they say that when you see somebody with a handicap card, you don't always know what the handicap is. And I think in this case, you see somebody who looks like a normal person, but you don't really know what goes on behind in their mind and what they experience in war or in the military. Um, so to help them navigate, again, their careers or life, um, I think this, it's something that if I can take an hour or two a week and help them, um, it, it's definitely bringing value and an impact and, and it's extremely gratifying. Talk about you. That sounds, that sounds super interesting and super amazing. Uh, I imagine what your years in the military is what uh, inspired you to want to be invested in the space. Is that, yeah? For sure. Because what you were seeing a problem and you were seeing that that too many people were having challenges translating? like. So I was seeing it, I didn't even realize, but when I was in the US and I got resumes as a hiring manager at Microsoft and I saw resumes of people who did what 30, 40 years in the Marines and had amazing experiences of being you know, technical project managers or whatever it was, experiences that were really transferable to what we needed, they just didn't know how to use the right terms. So when I read it or when somebody reads it, they understand what they did. Mm -hmm. Only somebody who had a military experience. Um, and, and I think that that's something that that's really a big gap that somebody just needed to tell them how to bridge it. Do you sit like one on one with 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 vets and like go through their resume and like I, I, I did when I was in the US. That's exactly what I did. I would sit with people a one on one, look at their resume, look at their LinkedIn profile, um, tell them how to use different words, different terms, what to say, what not to say. So when somebody who, ha who doesn't have that background reads their resume, they understand how that how what they did is relevant for what they're looking for. So interesting. Like I don't, if, if I saw no Navy SEAL on a resume, I'd be like, I'm hiring that guy. You would think, you, know, <laughs> you would think maybe, but uh, I, yeah. hear, I, hear, I hear the point that you're, uh, I hear the point that you're making. Talk a little bit about uh, what, I mean, I, I alluded to it. What are you seeing right now in the context of this not-for-profit restart? I mean, it must be overwhelming. I mean, how, how do, how do you even address kind of uh, so many soldiers it, who are, it, it is. Um, I think we're, 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 we haven't seen that wave coming yet. Um, but I think one of the most important and, and amazing things about we started, I'm sure other organizations as well, we have so many volunteers and, and mentors who are willing to help. So at this point, we have to have more mentors than, than what are needed, uh, which I think um, I, I want to think that's something unique to Israel because we're such a you know, close knit family when we need to be. Maybe it's not, but um, I I think it's a beautiful thing to see. Okay, Arno, thank you so much uh, for making the time, uh, sharing uh, a little bit, uh, Sitz, a little bit of your uh, of your experiences of your life. I found it to be very inspirational, and I want to wish you continued success uh, both in your for profit and your not for profit endeavors. Thank you.